I'm Cassidy Quinn, and welcome to the very first episode of Mentally Together! Because whether you can see it on the surface or not, we are all trying to keep ourselves mentally together. And whatever our brains are experiencing, we're not alone, we're together! On each episode, I'll chat with someone who is willing to be open and honest about their own mental health and the lessons we can all learn to feel better. They'll share their good days, their bad days, and everything in between. For me, having these kinds of conversations in my life is what actually helps my brain feel good. I mean, sure, there's antidepressants in there too, that definitely helps a lot, but saying my feelings out loud and actually talking through them is a huge part of it. I don't know if I ever would have actually taken the step of going to see my doctor about my depression if I hadn't been talking about my sad days to my friends and family members who told me, hey, I have those feelings too, and it's okay, you can get help. You don't have to feel this way forever, and you're not the only one. I also know that obviously this is sometimes easier said than done. Sometimes it can be really hard to find someone to talk to and it can be really freaking lonely. So for my very first guest on Mentally Together, I am talking with the person who I always get to cry and vomit up all my feelings on. <laughs> the one who is always there for a hug and to listen to the worst case scenario that my brain always seems to come up with. And of course, He's my adventure partner, and my roommate, and my boyfriend, Tucker Barney. Talking about our mental health has been part of our relationship since day one. Well, technically, to me, it's date number two, but Tucker thinks it was the first date. We fight about this a lot, as you'll see in this podcast. Not actual fighting, but in my mind, here's how it went. Date number two, we were at a concert, and the artist on stage said something about all these antidepressants. He was like, where's all my Lexapro people at? Where are my, I don't know the names of the other ones he called out because Lexapro was the one that I identified with because that is what I take for my brain. And I didn't say anything in the moment. I didn't cheer because again, it was our second date. We didn't know each other that well yet. But when Tucker gave me a ride home from our date that night, I knew I had to bring it up. It just seemed too obvious to not go, hey, remember that thing they said in that concert? Let's just talk about it. <laughs> but whether it was the first date, the second date, whatever. The point is, since the beginning of our relationship, it has been part of everything we do. We like to go on a lot of outdoor adventures, and every adventure we go on, we have to talk about where our brains are at, especially if I have an anxiety attack, like mid-adventure, which seems to happen a lot. <laughs> so we always try to just put our feelings out there. Does it always work out perfectly? No, absolutely not. But it's a process, as is everything relating to mental health as far as I'm concerned. But for me, this is definitely the first relationship I've ever been in where this has been the case, where we've been so open and honest with each other about our mental health. And honestly, it was a bit terrifying at first. And sometimes it's still terrifying when I'm having some really bad depressing thoughts in my brain and I say them out loud and it's really scary. But then every single time saying the words out loud has made it better, not worse. So that's what I always remind myself of. Now, before we get into this chat, I do want to mention that this episode does discuss some serious topics, including suicidal ideation. So if you are experiencing some of those feelings yourself, please reach out to a professional for help. You can always reach the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. Again, that's 1-800-273-8255. So now let's get into this episode with The Adventurous the manly and emotionally intelligent Tucker Barney. <laughs> that was quite the intro. Thank you for being the first ever <laughs> guest on the very first episode of the Mentally Together podcast. I feel super lucky. I feel honored to have you here because as I just said in the intro, you are that person that I get to just like throw all my feelings at, good or bad. Is that how it feels to you? I wouldn't say good or bad, necessarily. Yeah. Just what they are, when they are. Yeah. <laughs> but this whole, like, me throwing all of my feelings at you, it's not a new thing. 
basically since day one of the relationship, we've been talking about our brains and our feelings and our mental health. How do you remember us starting for that sure, conversation? For sure. Yeah, from literally date one, we were talking about mental health and super open about it. It's definitely a basis of our relationship for sure. Again, from date one. I would say date two. I would argue it was date two. That's, that's how fine. the story goes in my brain, but that's fine. We're talking about my version of it, and <laughs> that was from date one, which was a six to eight hour first date extravaganza, which we talked about everything under the moon from living in a van to yeah. mental health to fill in the blank. So, yeah, it's been... Yeah, really a staple, I think, of our relationship. I think one of the reasons why our relationship's been so strong. And it's funny because with this podcast, a lot of my goal is to, I mean, reduce the stigma about a lot of things, right? But a lot of times you see someone maybe like you and you look very manly and seem very confident and on the surface, just like when you pulled up to pick me up for our first date in your pickup truck with Idaho plates, I made a couple assumptions about you that were totally not true. So some people, I feel, may make the same assumptions about you before they really get to know you, that you're just this, like, super manly, outdoorsy man, which you are, but they might not know that, like, underneath that... So manly, by the way. Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> obviously. But they might not know that there's that layer, like, right below the surface that is super emotional Lee intelligent and emotional in general and just like the g- a caring kind good soul. Absolutely. Until there's a reason for it to come up necessarily in a more and I don't even want to say negative way cuz we're here trying to destigmatize but for a better way to put it most people see the outwardly positive, you know, masculine White male, right? Yeah, for sure. So perhaps, and pickup truck with Idaho (laughs) plates, now Oregon plates, happily, one might think from a surface level that stereotypically might not have openness of emotionalness, but we talk about the positive (laughs) side of it, and I am a super emotional person, an empath, if you will, and so, you know, you get the positive, but you also get the open, honest on the other side of it as well too yeah you describe it a lot as the pendulum swinging like yeah absolutely you're gonna have these emotions you're also gonna have these emotions and highs and and lows right there has to be an equal and opposite reaction to everything so yeah you don't turn into you know a lot of times in my life been known as mr positivity if you will and you don't get those high highs without some low lows as well too so that's been a journey to figure that out myself I I wrote down Mr. Positive because I feel like that's, I don't know if it's a name you gave yourself or just kind of a name that everyone around you started saying to you because you really are Mr. Positivity. Kind of a euphemism for anybody that's super outgoing and always, you know, like a lot of people talk about my stoke and so happy. And I just, I am, I'm a super vocal, again, empath. I get super stoked. If you need someone to wake you up and get really excited to go skiing at four o'clock in the freaking morning he's sometimes, your guy sometimes well before the sun has come <laughs> up i freaking love it i freaking love it and i'm vocal about it so that is what some people see and whether you want to call it mr positive mr stoke whatever certainly you know something that's been part of my life and really from the time i was really young i think natural propensity and i'm an eternal optimist but also ingrained in me from you know my mom who is the pinnacle eternal optimist and really, you know, instilled in me from her as as well as my dad. But I think, you know, everybody would say my mom is, you know, always the positive outlook. So natural propensity as well as a learned habit to become that person. Yeah, because I was going to And life's always more fun when you're excited. And my grandfather, there's something that makes letting out a hoot and holler when you're (laughs) ripping you know fresh pow turns that makes it that much more enjoyable too so that's a component of it also so with the positivity i feel like you also give off this air of confidence is that how it feels to you like do you feel super confident i definitely like to think that i'm a super confident person and i think that having confidence goes a long way in accomplishing things but i'm also an incredibly 
anxious person behind the scenes, incredibly self-conscious person behind the scenes. Um, the outward positivity is in a way a mechanism and a tool for me to do away with all of those inner workings that are happening at, you know, any given time as well. So yeah, both. <laughs> I am confident, but I also struggle with that as well. What do you remember growing up about, we talk a lot about toxic masculinity and I obviously am not a man. I did not grow up as a boy in this world. There are plenty of issues growing up as a girl in this world. Us men have it quite tough in this world. Yes, so Especially much. Especially us white men. Yes, the the most difficult. Um, Big asterisk on the dry sarcasm yes, here. Yes, yes. <laughs> Very privileged and lucky. Yeah, but as a little boy growing up in this world, there, I would think, are a lot of messages subliminal messages kind of being thrown at you of like be tough be a man don't cry young tuck yeah well i wouldn't even say subliminal messages <laughs> were told through a young age directly as well as indirectly subliminally exactly that to be tough to be a shoulder or support for other people and you know in a very traditional family sense again being that tough stable rudder for people and that is what a man does he's strong and he's tough and helps you know and perpetuated through everything within you know media and athletics and the social structures of you know junior high and high school and also you know growing up in idaho you know pretty traditional type structures and exposure a lot of times um growing up where i grew up as well too so a lot of layers to that one as well. How have you fought against that? Like, is that an intentional thing or? Yeah. And I certainly not a perfect track record and nobody, <laughs> nobody does. And I'm sure at times in my life, I absolutely have perpetuated toxic masculinity and some of these negative stereotypes. Like, absolutely. It's a learned concept and understanding you know, what I was going through and the effect of that desire to need to put on a strong face, you know, really ultimately led to me a place that I almost didn't come back from. And so there's a lot of layers to that, that I had to learn through again, my very extreme, severe experience, glad to have been exposed to the perils of it on one side and also how to begin to work in a more positive direction for, you know, masculinity and, and all um, outlooks of all sorts, right? Who I am today certainly is a growth person from who I was and as we all are, right? But definitely- You're a big. great growth person. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say asking for help is kind of, I don't know if antithesis is the right word, but like, is that a way to combat that, like, I think an antithesis to toxic masculinity is perfect. That is a huge ingrained component of toxic masculinity is you're strong enough. You can handle it on your own. You don't need help. You are the end all be all of strength. So absolutely. I think asking for help is a huge first step and in, in not just for toxic masculinity, but how we all move through our mental health challenges is understanding that is it is okay to ask for help. That's why we're a community herd species that, you know, lives and thrives off, off of social interaction. And part of that is helping each other move through our most difficult moments. So yeah, absolutely. I think asking for help is somewhat of an antithesis to toxic <laughs> masculinity for sure. Do you remember the first time that you did ask for help? Like you were when you were feeling depressed or 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 whatever it is, whatever space you were in. Yeah, I mean, hinted at it a couple times, but really had to move through a pretty severe moment of anxiety and depression and self identity crisis, and taking that really ingrained toxic masculinity for myself to such a deep dark place. Um, you know, as far as suicidal ideation. And again, I mentioned very cryptically, right? Like a place I almost didn't come back from and mean that in a very real sense. Yeah. 
and something that was, it took me getting to that place and those moments to realize how drastic it was. And then on the flip side, lucky to have a support system that enabled me to ask for help and then realize the easier and easier it became to talk about how I was feeling and asking for help and realizing this big thing that I had built up as this horrible, terrible thing really wasn't and shouldn't be seen as such an incredibly taboo thing, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I wanted to handle it on my own because I thought that's what I was supposed to do and I yeah. wasn't supposed to talk about it. And, and again, self-learned taught through these different, you know, social structures, if you will. And, and also, you know, has something to do with my mental makeup as well, but absolutely like had to go to that darkest place to then figure out how easy and how natural it should be. Um, at the moment it obviously wasn't, it was groundbreaking. Now it seems like second nature, right? Like if you're feeling something to just talk about it in a direct and open way and you'll be able to move through it with those around you that much easier. Yeah. Since this is the first episode of the podcast, and I'm sure this will not be the first time that something like suicidal ideation comes up on this podcast. Uh, what, how would you define that to anyone listening that doesn't know what that means exactly? Yeah, I mean, it's thinking that the only solution and the only way out is to just end the pain and end the hurt and the darkness seems so deep that there isn't a way out of it other than to just end it all. So, I mean, that really is what suicidal ideation is, right? Is, you know thinking that that's the solution to ending all of the pain and hurt and everything that's going on. Yeah. And I guess the ideation part, which is kind of weird to think about is like how, you know, okay, if that's the solution, then how, how is this thing going to go down? Right. Um, which is really terrible to think about, but like, that's, that's kind of what it is. Right. Is thinking yeah. about like, if, if this is the place we've gotten to and that is the only way out, right. Then, you know, how, how does that happen? Yeah. Well, I'm very, very grateful that you are here and you didn't go to the place that you could never come back from and grateful that that you do share your story. The first time I heard that story was before the first time you shared it publicly to your grad school class, um, but you shared it with me first and obviously I... I cried a lot now we kind of talk about it as if it's a, just a, which which is how this whole thing is supposed to work right it should like be. you talk about your issues and the sad moments and eventually you can get to a point where you can just talk about them like it was something that's not happening now and you're not still in that right yeah. is that how yeah. it feels i mean my body's still clenched like i'm still yeah. this is only the second time i've talked about it on camera which is also pretty odd and still you know even trying to destigmatize it and bring awareness to it and talk about it more openly, it's still difficult. It's still, you know, it's never going to be something that's easy to talk about, right? Like I can just feel that my body is like yeah. tight, just like leading up to, and even trying to figure out how to say it. Mm-hmm. And again, it shouldn't be. It's something that, again, we should all be supported moving through our darkest moments and, that really is the purpose of, you know, this podcast and, and what you're trying to do here that's so special is just making real conversations happen about these subjects that don't need to be taboo and encouraging real conversations so that people don't get to the place where yeah. I got to, right? Like my mantra, I guess, at the end of my grad school keynote was let's make it okay to not be okay, right? Like let's make it okay to talk about these things and and help each other move through them. And that's, you know, but even with that, it's still difficult, right? It's never going to be totally easy. As you may or may not know, I am a self-proclaimed crazy plant lady. But as of just a couple years ago, I was convinced I would forever be a plant killer. 
That is until I met the plant doctors. They're two women, Chelsea and Skylar, in Portland, Oregon, who love helping people and businesses figure out how to care for their plants. And they sell cute plants and adorable plant pots too. They have brought lots of beauty into my home. They do house calls if you're here in Portland, or you can set up a virtual consultation to get their plant tips online. Do I still kill my plants sometimes? Yes, definitely. But the plant doctors are always there to help. Go get yourself a new plant. You deserve it. You can find them at theplantdocs.com. That's theplantdocs, D-O-C-S, dot com. And use the code Cassidy for 15% off your order. That's code Cassidy at theplantdocs.com. I love nut butter. Okay, that definitely sounds weird when I say it out loud in audio form, but you know you love it too, okay? Some toast with some nut butter on it in the morning. Mmm. So let me introduce you to my favorite nut butter makers, Ground Up. They make super unique flavors like cinnamon snickerdoodle, coconut cardamom, and Oregon hazelnut. I can honestly never pick a favorite, but that is not the only thing that makes them unique. Ground Up's tagline is spread good because the company also provides job opportunities to women overcoming adversity like incarceration, homelessness, and mental illness. You can support their mission by buying some delicious nut butter for yourself at grounduppdx.com and use the code mentally together, all one word, for 15% off your order. That's code mentally together, all one word, at grounduppdx.com. Now, back to the show. I actually want to take a second to play a clip of that speech you gave to your grad school class. The boy had been told his whole life, be a man. So the boy made sure everyone knew just how much fun he was having and just how okay he really was. Truth is, that same boy was sleeping through the days, crying through countless nights, in pain, physically and mentally. The young boy was determined to make it on his own. He was determined to be a man. How damaging those words and ideals can be. How fucking silly. It got to be too much, and eventually the boy found himself turning away from the parties, from the people, and started turning toward the only thing that felt like it would make the pain stop. One evening, while everyone else was out partying, the young boy had his own time. Downing the better part of a bottle of whiskey, the boy sat in his room and slowly tried to count the numbers of painkillers he had left. Estimating whether or not that would be enough to end the pain for good. Shaking and crying, he never made it through the count. And luckily never followed through with a mistake that would have changed everything. Following this breakdown, understanding how close he came to doing something so stupid, the boy finally went and asked for help. To his surprise, he wasn't shamed or shunned. In fact, he finally got the help and tools that he needed to move through this seemingly insurmountable pain. When you were going through your lowest moments, was there anything anyone around you did that was really helpful to you? Like people reaching out or anything someone said to you? Yeah, I mean, there definitely were people around me encouraging me to talk about how I was feeling and and people that recognized what was going on. Again, lucky to have a support system that ultimately kept me from doing something so stupid, quite frankly. And so, you know, certainly had people encouraging me to to talk and speak up and just be more open and honest, not only with them, but I think their encouragement meant more to me in terms of being more honest with myself about how I was feeling and what was happening, right? Because I was putting that face on to not only the world, but also conning myself into thinking that I was doing fantastically, right? So, Ooh, you know, yeah. certainly a lot of people close, you know, encouraging that, 
you know, emotional honesty again with them, but by proxy, really trying to be honest with myself about what was going on. I remember from your grad school presentation, it's okay to not be okay. And also let's treat our mental pains in the same way we deal with physical injuries, yeah, right? That's been one of the biggest things in my, you know, story of mental health so strongly tied to athletics and a physical injury and then the mental component of it being a byproduct of that injury and, and the self-identity crisis that came along with it. And through all of that and into modern day coming to Again, a realization of my pendulum swing, you know, the positive high highs come with a a smattering of low lows and, and anxiety and self-doubt and whatever the case may be, fill in the blank. So part of all of this is also coming to the realization and professing and encouraging to people that I think we need to take care of our brains in the same way we take care of our bodies, right? Like we eat well and we exercise But what about the mental cultivation of your own, right? Like, and not only is it encouraging, you know, reading and spending time outside and and resetting, but then also like mental exercise, right? Like what is going to make your brain stronger and your mental resilience stronger, right? Like I think that the more you build these toolkits, one of them being just freaking talking about it you're able to, you know, weather these things and move through them and therefore coming to terms with the fact that sometimes there are mental mental intricacies that we have. So therefore we need mental exercise of some fashion to learn how to combat them. How do we think that we can just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and just get after it when we're, you know, feeling low for no reason, right? It's kind of silly to think about, right? It's yeah. in the same way that you know, you don't just, okay, tomorrow I have to run 10 miles, so I'm just going to do it. And my leg is broken. Right. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's interesting too. Screw it. Rip the cast off. I'm just going to go for a run. Like that's how we deal with that, our brains. That kind is of. such an yeah. interesting analogy, right? Like <laughs> if your brain, and I, I don't want to say like broken, but like if there is an intricacy of similar to a broken arm, like you're not going to you know, or in my case, a torn labrum, like you can't play baseball physically. Yeah. yeah. These mental injuries, intricacies, again, I, I want to frame it up in a more positive light, are there, right? So they have to be exercised. You have to build a toolkit to move around them and think about it. And it's pretty abstract until, you know, you put it into some of those terms and it's like, huh. That seems like such intuitive sense. How is this not something that we're doing, right? Like, again, emphasizing mental. And I think even mentally healthy, quote unquote, people should go and talk to a therapist and see what it's all about. Go talk to somebody and see, well, one, it's really not as big a deal as people make it out to be, right? Like, ooh, this, you know, again, this thing that's kind of stigmatized. And again, I think even healthy people should exercise their brain the same way that we all You know, it's not just injury recovery or, you know, injury prevention. It's just wellness and being, right? What are those mental exercises or those things that you try to incorporate into your daily life so that, like, to work on your brain and not get to those, I'm putting my hand up, but, like, the low points, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, too, because I would say early on in my mental health journey, And the extremeness of it and because of the taboo nature that I perceived was attached to it, I needed the more formal structures of a therapist. Moving through those more severe moments and again, encouraging even mentally healthy people to go and and just see what a therapist is all about. And There were air quotes around mentally healthy for anyone (laughs) listening to the audio version. (laughs) Oh, yes. I forget that this is uh, the podcast. In the early days of my mental health journey, really seeing those more formalized lanes as what I needed, that structure to move through it. Whereas in present day, you know, while I still will reach out to a therapist, et cetera, if, if needed, more so finding daily routines for that injury prevention, if you will, that mental conditioning. Um, again, in the early days, like regularly seeing a therapist, 
exploring options with medication uh, and and undertaking some and, and finding other ways other than medication to move through it myself. And, you know, in present day, I know that I feel better when I get outside, at least for, you know, a couple hours a day. Yes. Getting after, you know, some physical achievements outdoors, whether it's, you know, this past weekend, sunrise, ski tour up (laughs) Mount Hood, down to, uh, you know, mountain biking in the same, it just... While I was sleeping in, FYI. <laughs> needing to feel those senses of accomplishment and exploring, you know, my body and my mind outside and not even the extremeness of it, but just spending that time in nature. I really, you know, I go back and forth on how good I am about the habit, but I know when I meditate every day or close to every day that that just absolutely grounds me. And I feel like that that... When I think about mental exercise, I really do think more about meditation and breathing exercises, um, as well as, you know, yoga is somewhat of a hybrid between mm-hmm. the physical and mental components of it, but it, I feel better when I eat well, I feel better when I sleep well and, you know, carve that time out for myself. I also find an incredible amount of recharge for myself in reading, just absolutely sitting down, whether it's a novel or nonfiction learning, looking at real text on a page, you know, really helps, helps my brain feel better as well. So it's, you know, for everybody it's different, but for me, I would really point towards meditation, reading and spending time outside and and getting physical and pushing myself in that manner as well. Yeah. You're really good at getting time outside like you usually will do it before you get to the point where at least from my perspective it seems like you'll always get outside before you get to the point where you're like oh my god I've been inside for five days I'm going crazy I will get to that point and then realize like oh all I've done is walk yesterday we drove I don't even remember where we drove it was like five minutes from our house and I said to you I haven't gone more than a block away from our house in in a couple weeks, so thank you for that. Um, but you're really good at and like, getting ahead of that. And it taxes you until yeah. you don't realize that it has. Uh huh. Like, oh, you don't get the vitamin D like sitting inside. You have to, you have to leave the house. Oh, oh, and okay. So much more pertinent in quarantine, right? Uh-huh. Even in normal times, our lives get busy. But you know, for me, my work as well as my passion and recharge all come, you know, outside it. Yeah. I'd live outside if we could in some fashion and I hope we do (laughs) some (laughs) hybrid someday. But yeah, I think that that, you know, time spent and not just, you know, connecting with nature, but also just reconnecting with yourself. I think Mm -hmm. spending time on your own in your own head and becoming more comfortable with yourself, talking to yourself also, again, helps you through those low, low moments, but then also helps you feel good about those high high moments there's nothing like that that sense of independence and restorative time like spent in nature by yourself so now into the future tuck you you get outside you do these things you have punch toxic masculinity in the face in my opinion um <laughs> what do you do if you wake up and you're having a really sad day you're just you're off. You're feeling depressed. You're feeling anxious. Whatever whatever labels you put on those feelings, what are those things that you do to go? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna turn this around. Obviously, some of them are the same as the preventative things. Yeah, um, I mean, a lot of it goes hand in hand. But I think again, the first step of that process is again just having the self awareness and self truthfulness to just admit to yourself that you're not having a great day and that's okay. And you don't have to be stoked and on it. And, you know, even as somebody who people expect to be stoked and on it, and I love being that person, right? Like I really do thrive on bringing that energy to the people I love and the work that I love, but some days you're going to feel like shit and that's okay to wake up and and just know that that. And so that is the first thing, you know, it's just that awareness and even, you know, saying it out loud to you, it, it helps to vocalize it and say, okay, like today is not going to be one of my best days, but also having that confidence again, whether believed or, or just using it to help push yourself through that, you know, 
when I get to the end of the day, if I persevere through this day, it's okay if I don't and I need to, you know, it is a low enough day to take a mental health day. That's okay. But also know that if I persevere, I feel like shit, but I'm still going to move through the day and what I was supposed to get done today. Like you're going to feel good about it. That Mm -hmm. also helps, right? Allowing yourself the patience if you don't, but also knowing, okay, I feel like shit. If I do just chug through whatever it is, you know, and one might think I'm talking about work, but sometimes even it's the fun days, right? Like sometimes I have plans to go, you know, mountain bike or, or, you know, shred on the skis with, with the friends. And even sometimes those days it's like, damn, I don't feel awesome, but I know I'm going to feel good if I go spend some time outside and spend some time with my friends, like waking up with the pendulum on the opposite side of the swing, Mm -hmm. it's not going to be, convenient right a lot of times it is when you've got fun stuff going on that that should be fun and again giving yourself the opportunity to sit out if you need to sit out sometimes that's safer better etc but you know or or work whether it's friends or work it's it's great to have groups again very lucky to be surrounded by friends family and and work that supports you know mental health days just the same as they support sick days and a partner that also supports, you know, mental health days the same as if I'm, you know, puking my guts out because it's the same, right? Yeah. And honestly, in a lot puking of ways, your brain out. <laughs> well, it's interesting hearing you say like sometimes it comes up on work days and sometimes it comes up on the fun. I mean, your work is fun, my work is fun, so I don't mean to totally draw a line between those two. But like some right. days a we work live, day, we're lucky some... to live our work and work to live. Yes, but yeah. some days it's those adventure days, and I feel like those are often the days that you have to get to however you want to say it help me through because my brain has learned for better or for worse how to shut it off when it's time to work if i when i was doing my tv show and i was having a panic attack 10 minutes before showtime my brain knew shut it down you got to go talk to people and put on a little show for 27 minutes of television and then you can go home and cry your brains out whatever you want but Then on like a Saturday when we're getting up to go do our avalanche training course, for example, a year ago, my brain goes, well, it's free time, so let's have a sad, I'm I'm anxious, I'm scared about this activity, I am overwhelmed because I want to take pictures of it and my, and my GoPro is full and so I can't take video and then, oh my god, all of a sudden I've gone to this total overwhelmed feeling and this was supposed to be fun and ah, and then... You usually see that in me and go, what is going on, woman? You don't say it like that at all. You say like, hey, babe, are you okay? Like, thank you. <laughs> and, yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it can show up on the on the days that are supposed to be the most fun. And fun absolutely. things can be stressful and they can make you super anxious. Right. And you should feel okay taking a mental health day away from social activities, work, what have you. Mm-hmm. Again, we're both very lucky to to have the ability to do so, but also realizing when it is supposed to be fun and realizing that it's, those are the times, and I think it's easiest to recognize, okay, this is actually fun. And if I do just push myself to move through it, I'm likely going to feel better. It's the same thing if I have, you know, plans to go ski or bike and it's like, I know at the end of this, I'm going to feel better, but it's for work too, right? Like if you Mm -hmm. do have the ability to challenge yourself, I think that in itself is a mental exercise, right? When you can show yourself, I can turn it off and go get on TV for 27 minutes. And again, it's a healthy balance of of knowing when to push yourself and when it's okay and you need to step back, but I think it feels great. Again, like it's just, it's, it's, a mental exercise within itself when you push yourself through on some of those days, work, fun, what have you got to know your limits and and when to say, you know, you need to sit this one out, Mm -hmm. but also understanding that we as very strange self-reflective beings can move through a hell of a lot more than our brains would lead us to believe. Right. Yeah. So that's a huge, huge component of it as well. If you're loving this episode of Mentally Together, you might be curious. What goes on behind the scenes? Which parts of the conversation were left on the cutting room floor? Well, let's talk about it over on Patreon. 
My patrons get to see deleted video clips from every episode and get to be the first to ask questions of each podcast guest. And every month, I host an exclusive live stream for patrons only, where we actually get to hang out and talk to each other. Not that you necessarily needed another Zoom call in your life, but this one is fun, I promise. Oh, and as one of my patrons, you get every episode of the show a day early, on Sundays. You can read all about the different tiers and sign up at patreon.com slash Cassidy Quinn. Again, that's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Cassidy Quinn. Okay, now we have some questions from our friends on the internet. Woohoo! <laughs> first up are the questions from my friends over on Patreon, which means their questions get to come first. So, Austin wants to know, I think it would be interesting to hear about the benefits and challenges of being in a relationship with someone who has also had mental health struggles. How do you communicate with the other person when your brain is struggling? And have you gotten better at being able to read when the other person is struggling? I wouldn't necessarily, like... Saying there's benefits and challenges of being in a relationship who has mental health struggles, like that's not even necessarily how I would frame it up because you don't get one without the other. And Mm -hmm. there are just days when we're not totally our happy, loving, optimistic, positive selves. And that's just something that is, right? Like we... We are that and it's just having the patience and ability to have those open dialogues with your partner to move through it, right? Like even if you don't have mental health struggles and we're lucky that we both have each other to understand because we've both been through our own, Mm -hmm. right? Even if you don't have mental health intricacies, right? then, you know, you're going to have benefits and challenges in any relationship and it's just being loving and caring enough that you're going to move through all those days. And that just is how it goes. I will say to answer how have you gotten better at being able to read when the other person is struggling? I would say, yes, absolutely. We have both gotten better at that. And that has, at least for me, helped me figure out when I am struggling Um, because sometimes for me, my anxiety does manifest itself as being irritable and short-tempered and just super stressed and like you'll I don't know leave a pair of shoes on the floor and I trip over them because I'm clumsy and then I'm like oh my god like eh, eh, eh." I I turn into not the the person that I that I want to be for a second and sometimes you know you'll come back with what I kind of deserve in that moment of like what the hell is going on but then we kind of take a pause for a second and I go, oh, or you might point it out a lot of the times, like, are you feeling okay? Like, you seem, what's, what's stressing you out here? It's not my shoes on the floor, right? Like, yeah. what is, what's going on here? And then I can go, oh, oh, yeah, no, your shoes are fine. I just, I'm not fine right now. And I need a hug and I need to cry. And so I think we've both gotten better seeing that in the other person and giving the forgiveness of if, your brain not feeling good made you react in a way that wasn't the caring, loving, significant other that you want to be in that moment. The other one's like, okay, I get it. It's okay. It's okay. Like, we're not going to fight for an hour about how you just yelled at me about my shoes on the floor. Like, that's the point is that I need to give you a hug and not be mad at you. Right. Right. Whether it's, you know, me having a similar reaction to something that's going on being like, okay, (laughs) holy shit. I didn't mean to just be a dick. Like (laughs) I'm actually just not feeling great and just self-professing that. And because we both have had these intricacies, you know, we do, I think, recognize it easier in one another for sure. I think there's benefits, not necessarily to having someone that has depression or has anxiety or has ADHD, but someone who has gotten in touch with that and understands that in themselves. I do, I think is very valuable in a partner So I would say all benefits. Sara says, when you feel lost slash out of control slash lonely slash hopeless, how does Tucker handle those emotions and not make things worse or add to those feelings? I think that's a really hard thing for significant others to understand. When I'm 
feel hopeless, like how do you handle those emotions? Because my brain has a tendency to go worst case scenario and we'll be sitting on the couch like watching some stupid show and then five minutes later my brain is off the deep end like thinking my career is over and I'm just the worst and uh, uh, yeah. What do you what what do you do? <laughs> How do you handle those feelings? I think that again, similarly to the last question, it's through patience and compassion and understanding again that that we both have those moments and it is okay to be unrealistically upset and you know not always perfect uh, with the patience and you know none of us are. But it's, again, having that patience and compassion to help the other person move through something that is totally irrational and vocalizing that. Hey, this is an irrational thought, feeling, etc. Like, how can we move back from the precipice of anxiety or panic attack or etc., etc., right? Like, it's just that let's label it what it is, call it what it is, and then let's figure out how to move back away from it. Yeah, and you, a lot of times, like, I will say a worst-case scenario, and then you kind of help me, like, break it down. And sometimes that really is helpful for me to go, like, what is the absolute worst thing that can happen right now? Say that to you. It feels absolutely ridiculous. And then you can be like, okay, well, it's probably not going to happen, but, like, if that does happen, you'll also, like, be okay. Like, if you never work on camera another day in your life, like, let's go skiing, Cool. Yeah. Fine. Your body works. Great. It's all relative. It's all relative. And at the end of the day, right, putting it in that perspective of, you know, life happens. It's going to continue to happen. Mm -hmm. We have to grow resilience toward it. This year, we're all acutely aware of that resilience. And Ooh, yeah. I, you know, really do think that putting in perspective like that, right, like it's not mm -hmm. the end of the world. We're still healthy. We can still, you know live our lives in the way that we want to mm -hmm. and you know it's gonna be okay crystal wants to know what advice would he give other men who struggle with mental health and talking about it again i think the first step is destigmatizing and getting comfortable again with yourself and honesty with yourself and you know then opening up to your partner and i think that again sometimes as scary and intimidating as it sounds like traditional therapy can help move you through those first steps. If you're not comfortable being open with your partner for one reason or another, find somebody else to talk to and not your buddies when you're, you know, drinking beers, doing whatever. But that's what I was going to ask as a follow up. Like you say opening up with your partner, but like, what about with your buddies while you're drinking a beer? Like, I honestly think you know? that that that's a good space if you already have, you know, a welcoming group of, of men, but in a toxic masculinity, yeah, yeah. right? That's kind of the scenario we're talking about. If you already have the group of guys you can talk to, then you're not the one asking this question, right? Like, I think it's harder to do in a friend group until I, I think personally it would be, can you talk to yourself and be honest with yourself about it first? then probably partner slash, you know, therapist, professional. And then I think, honestly, it's your friends after your partner. That, mm -hmm. you know, kind of social pressure is one of the hardest places, I think, to tackle it. And once we can all talk about it within our friend groups, you know, we're going to be making a lot further strides. I, I honestly think it's easier in a trust built relationship than it is in a trust built friendship just because of all the different intricacies that come with that yeah and the last one comes from emily she says when you were at your lowest point what thoughts did you have about those who care about you about your parents family friends i know suicidal thoughts are about ending your pain and in no way do i find it selfish but i do wonder did you have thoughts on how it would impact those who love you yeah, ultimately, you know, very astute and pointed question, mm -hmm. Emily, that that's ultimately what brought me back from the precipice, if you will, was the thought of what destruction would that have on my parents and my sister and, you know, my friends and, and other, you know, tertiary family members. But I think holding on to those closest to you is, you know, really what 
what helped bring me back. And again, lucky to have those people to lean on, even if you don't have and aren't privileged to have immediately immediate friends and family members. Like I think everybody has a reason to be here. Everybody has a a way they can contribute to society and have a fun and fulfilling well and fuck contributing to society. <laughs> I think that everybody can live and have a fulfilling life themselves. Like you deserve to be here. And but I do think that thinking about your friends and family and, and the destruction that it would sow, right? That ultimately realizing that it was you know, somewhat of a selfish thing. If I thought that this was the way out, I really was only thinking about myself because yeah, it would end the pain for me, but it would only begin the pain for all these multitudes of other loved ones. And so, yeah, ultimately, you know, when I thought I had nothing left, at least my guilt about what I was about to leave behind, you know, kept me from making the ultimate mistake. So yeah, very astute question. You're wonderful. Okay, last but not least, we have the quick question round. Okay, when is the last time you cried? I don't know, probably sometime within the last year. The last year? Wow. Definitely some some crying moments in 2020, for sure. I, I wouldn't say that crying is typically an outlet for me. I know yeah. that that emotionally can build up for people. It's pretty serious if I'm crying and and have that complete. I usually like to talk about it. I'll and, be crying and move through it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, obviously, there's moments of tearing up, and I'll, I, I cried last night. Will readily <laughs> three times. <laughs> again, no stigma to it, but I like I'll cry if I need to, and sometimes it can feel good, but it's just not necessarily a, a typical outlet for me. It's what my podcast, and I can cry if I want to. <laughs> what an interesting question. Thank you. What are you grateful for right now? I hate cliches, but love to live cliches. You don't hate cliches. I, yeah, I really don't. <laughs> but I'm super grateful for absolutely everything in my life right now. I'm really lucky to be living my work like I've always wanted to in, in a job and in a family company that I you know love to work for. I have Shout out to Smith Optics. <laughs> have an amazing partner to move through this dream of mine that I've been chasing forever. You know, I get to do the things that I want to do on the weekends, chasing, you know, these suffer fests of, of my own physical capability. And my family is in good health. Luckily, you know, knock on wood, we continue to stay that way. I'm very lucky and and privileged to be where I'm at right now. So grateful for all of the above what is the best thing you do for your mental health again when i'm on that meditation well exercise getting outside and again that medit it's kind of the trifecta really of those those things what's the worst thing that maybe you should stop doing honestly i think it's usually somehow related to alcohol you Mm -hmm. know i i do love to have a couple couple bevies with the with the friends victory beers after the missions but try to keep it a little curtailed these days because it just does affect my body and mind. Yeah, I second that one. What's your favorite thing about your brain? It has been coming to terms with and accepting that I am the most overthinker of all overthinkers. Shout out to, you know, my overthinkers out there. How many times am I going to say that word? Thank you for the shout out. I, I, I received it but, as an overthinker. Uh, I've learned to appreciate that about my brain really thinking through all, all different outcomes and, and situations and has I've learned to turn it into a tool of my own um, in a lot of ways. What's your biggest guilty pleasure? haagen Rocky Road ice cream. Ooh, good one. When do you feel most yourself? On the snow, traveling through the mountains. If you wrote a biography right now, what would it be called? The Wannabe Cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> Modern day cowboy. I guess to, to, to paint myself in a more positive light. Can we rewind to three minutes ago when you said you don't like cliches <laughs> and you just named your book Modern Day Cowboy? Oh um, man, that's so cheesy. It's ridiculous. Can't take it back. What's something you're really good at that people might not know? I have an answer for you. Yeah, go for it. Swing dancing? Oh yeah, sure. Sure. I guess <laughs> that is my usual go-to for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I love to swing dance. Last one. 
if you had to get something tattooed on your forehead, like everyone's doing it now, it's a rule, you gotta get like a personal billboard essentially that people would always see, you walk by them, it could be a message to yourself in the mirror and just out to the world, what would your forehead tattoo say? Love yourself. Ooh. If I had to have something tattooed on my forehead, it better be something that made people feel good every time they read it. Yeah. It's horrifying to think about forehead tattoo. But I mean, if I had to have something on my forehead, yeah, I would say that it has to be really bringing serious positivity yeah. into people's lives. That was a great answer. Okay. I, Are we done here? Thank you. Thank you for sitting down with me. Yeah. The first episode. You're wonderful. And I love you. I love you too. And thank you, wonderful human listening to this episode, for joining me on Mentally Together. We release new episodes every Monday. So, I, Cassidy Quinn, will see you next week. In the meantime, go do something nice for your brain today. Get outside, call a friend and talk about your feelings, or, I don't know, take a bath, sit on the couch, do nothing. Whatever will make your day just a little bit better. Because remember, we are all just trying to keep ourselves mentally together. Together is produced, hosted, and edited by Cassidy Quinn in collaboration with Koba FM, a podcast network that is all about community, baby.